Section 35 of A Visit to the Holy Land. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 18 of A Visit to the Holy Land, Egypt and Italy, Part 1. By Ida L. Pfeiffer. October 4th. At eight o'clock in the evening, I embarked on board the Sicilian steamer Hercules, of two hundred and sixty horsepower, the largest and finest vessel I had yet seen. The officers here were not nearly so haughty and disobliging as those on board the Euratus. Even now I cannot think without a smile of the airs of the captain of the latter vessel gave himself. He appeared to consider that he had as good a right to be an admiral as Bruce. At ten o'clock we steamed out of the harbor of Lavalette. As it was already dark night, I went below and retired to rest. October 5th. When I hurried on deck this morning, I found we were already in sight of the Sicilian coast, and, oh, happiness, I could distinguish green hills, wooded mountains, glorious dells, and smiling meadows, a spectacle I had enjoyed neither in Syria, in Egypt, nor even at Malta. Now I thought at length to behold Europe, for Malta resembles the Syrian regions too closely to favor the idea that we are really in Europe. Towards eleven o'clock we reach Syracuse. Unfortunately, we could get only four hours' leave of absence, as several gentlemen among the passengers wished to devote these few hours to seeing all the lions of this once rich and famous town. I joined their party and went ashore with them. Scarcely had we landed before we were surrounded by a number of servants and a mob of curious people, so that we were almost obliged to make our way forcibly through the crowd. The gentleman hired a guide, and desired to be at once conducted to a restaurateur, who promised to prepare them a modest luncheon within half an hour. The prospect of a good meal seemed of more importance in the eyes of my fellow passengers than anything else. They resolved to have luncheon first, and afterward to take a little walk through the city. On hearing this I immediately made a bargain with a cicerone to show me what he could in four hours, and went with him, leaving the company seated at a table. Though I had got nothing to eat to-day but a piece of bread and a few figs, which I dispatched on the road, I saw some sights which I would not have missed for the most sumptuous entertainment. Of the once spacious town nothing remains but a very small portion, inhabited by ten thousand persons at most. The dirty streets were everywhere crowded with people, as though they dwelt out of doors while the houses stood empty. Accompanied by my guide, I passed hastily through the new town, and over three or four wooden bridges to Neopolis, the part of ancient Syracuse in which monuments of the past are seen in the best state of preservation. First we came to the theater. This building is tolerably well preserved, and several of the stone seats are still seen rising in terrace form, one above the other. From this place we betook ourselves into the amphitheater, which is finer by far, and where we find passages leading to the wild beasts' dens, and above them rows of seats for spectators. All is in such good condition that it might, at a trifling expense, be so far repaired as to be made again available for its original purpose. Now we proceeded to the ear of Dionysus, with which I was particularly struck. It consists of a number of chambers, partly hewn out of the rock by art, partly formed by nature, and all opening into an immensely lofty hall, which becomes narrower and narrower towards the top, until it at length terminates in an aperture so minute as to be invisible from below. To this aperture Dionysus is said to have applied his ear, in order to overhear what the captives spoke. This place is stated to have been used as a prison for slaves and malefactors. It is usual to fire a pistol here, that the stranger may hear the reverberating echoes. A lofty opening, resembling a great gate, forms the entrance to these rocky passages. Overgrown with ivy, it has rather the appearance of a bower than that of a place of terror and anguish. Several of these side halls are now used as workshops by rope makers, while in others the manufacture of saltpeter is carried on. The region around is rocky, but without displaying any high mountains. I saw numerous grottoes, some of them with magnificent entrances, which looked as though they had been cut in the rocks by art. In one of these grottoes water fell from above, forming a very pretty cataract. 
During this excursion the time had passed so rapidly that I was soon compelled to think, not of a visit to the catacombs, but of my return on board. I proceeded to the seashore, where the Syracusans have built a very pretty promenade, and have rowed back to the steamer. Of all the passengers I was the only one who had seen anything of Syracuse. All the rest had spent the greater part of the time allowed them in the inn, and at most had been for a short walk in the town. But they had obtained an exceedingly good dinner, and thus we had each enjoyed ourselves in our own way. At three o'clock we quitted the beautiful harbor of Syracuse, and three hours brought us to Catania. This voyage was one of the most beautiful and interesting that can be imagined. The traveler continually sees the most charming landscapes of blooming Sicily, and at Syracuse we can already descry on a clear day the giant Etna rearing its head ten thousand feet above the level of the sea. At six in the evening we disembarked, but those going farther had to be on board again by midnight. I had intended to remain at Catania and ascend Mount Etna, but on making inquiries I was assured that the season was too far advanced for such an undertaking, and therefore resolved to set sail again at midnight. I went on shore in company with the Neapolitan and his wife, for the purpose of visiting some of the churches, a few public buildings, and the town itself. The buildings, however, were already closed, though the exteriors promised much. We could only deplore that we had arrived an hour too late to, and take a walk around the town. I could scarcely wonder enough at the bustle in the crowded squares and chief streets, and at the shouting and screaming of the people. The number of inhabitants is about fifty thousand. The two chief streets, leading in different directions from the great square, are long, broad, and particularly well paved with large stone slabs. They contain many magnificent houses. The only circumstance which displeased me was that everywhere, even in the chief streets, the people dry clothes on large poles at balconies and windows. This makes the town look as though it were inhabited by a race of washerwomen. I should not even mind so much if they were clean clothes, but frequently I saw the most disgusting rags fluttering in front of splendid houses. Unfortunately, this barbarous custom prevails throughout the whole of Sicily, and even in Naples, the hanging out of clothes is only forbidden in the principal street, the Toledo. All the other streets are full of linen. Among the equipages, which were rolling to and fro in great numbers, I noticed some very handsome ones. Some were standing still in the great square, while their occupants amused themselves by looking at the bustle around them, and chatted with friends and acquaintances who crowded round the carriages. I found a greater appearance of life here than either at Naples or Palermo. The convent of St. Nicholas was unfortunately closed, so that we could only view its exterior. It is a spacious, magnificent building, the largest, in fact, in the whole town. We also looked at the walks on the seashore, which at our first arrival we had traversed in haste in order to reach the town quickly. Beautiful avenues extend along each side of the harbor. They are, however, less frequented than the streets and squares. We had a beautiful moonlight night. The promontory of Etna, with its luxurious vegetation, as well as the giant mountain itself, were distinctly visible in all their glory. The summit rose cloudless and free. No smoke came from the crater, nor could we discover a trace of snow as we returned to our ship. We noticed several heaps of lava piled on the seashore of a perfectly black color. Late in the evening we adjourned to an inn to refresh ourselves with some good dishes, and afterwards returned to the steamer, which weighed anchor at midnight. October 6th. We awoke in the harbor of Messina. The situation of this town is lovely beyond description. I was so charmed with it that I stood for a long time on deck without thinking of landing. A chain of beautiful hills and large masses of rock in the background surround the harbor and town. Everywhere the greatest fertility reigns, and all things are in the most thriving and flourishing condition. In the direction of Palermo the boundless ocean is visible. I now bade farewell to the splendid steamer Hercules, because I did not intend to proceed directly to Naples, but to make a detour by way of Palermo. As soon as I had landed, I proceeded to the office of the merchant M., to whom I had a letter of recommendation. I requested Herr M. to procure me a cicerone as soon as possible, 
as I wished to see the sights of Messina, and afterwards to continue my journey to Palermo. Herr M. was kind enough to send one of his clerks with me. I rested for half an hour, then commenced my peregrination. From the steamer Messina had appeared to me a very narrow place, but on entering the town I found that I had made quite a false estimate of its dimensions. Messina is certainly built in a very straggling oblong form, but still its breadth is not inconsiderable. I saw many beautiful squares, for instance the chief square, with its splendid fountain ornamented with figures, and a bas-relief of carved work in bronze. Every square contains a fountain, but we seldom find anything particularly tasteful. The churches are not remarkable for the beauty of their facades, nor do they present anything in the way of marble statues or finely executed pictures. The houses are generally well built, with flat roofs, the streets, with few exceptions, are narrow, small, and very dirty. An uncommonly broad street runs parallel with the harbor, and contains, on one side at least, some very handsome houses. This is a favorite place for a walk, for we can here see all the bustle and activity of the port. Several of the palaces also are pretty. That appropriated to the Senate is the only one which can be called fine, the staircase being constructed entirely of white marble, in a splendid style of architecture. The halls and apartments are lofty, and generally arched. The regal palace is also a handsome pile. In the midst of the town I found an agreeable public garden. The Italians appear, however, to choose the streets as places of rendezvous, in preference to enclosures of this kind, for everywhere I noticed that the garden walks were empty, and the streets full. But on the whole there is not nearly so much life here as at Catania. In order to obtain a view of the whole of Messina and its environs, I ascended a hill near the town, surmounted by a Capuchin convent. Here I enjoyed a prospect which I have seldom seen equaled. As I gazed upon it, I could easily imagine that an inhabitant of Messina can find no place in the world so beautiful as his native town. The promontory against which the town leans is clothed with a carpet of the brightest green, planted with fruit-trees of all kinds, and enlivened with scattered towns, villages, and country seats. Beautiful roads, appearing like white bands, intersect the mountains on every side in the direction of the town. The background is closed by high mountains, sometimes wooded, sometimes bare, now rising in the form of Alps, now in the shape of rocky masses. At the foot of the hills we see the long-drawn town, the harbor with its numerous ships, and beyond it groups of Alps and rocks. The boundless sea flows on the spectator's right and left towards Palermo and Naples, while in the direction of Catania the eye is caught by mountains, with Etna towering among them. The same evening I embarked on board the Duke of Calabria for the short trip of twelve or fourteen hours to Palermo. This steamer has only engines of eighty horsepower, and everything connected with it is small and confined. The first-class accommodation is indeed pretty good, but the second-class places are only calculated to contain very few passengers. Though completely exhausted by my long and fatiguing walk through Messina, I remained on deck, for I could not be happy without seeing Stromboli. Unfortunately, I could distinguish very little of it. We had started from Messina at about six o'clock in the evening, and did not come in sight of the mountain until two hours later when the shades of night were already descending. We were, besides, at such a distance from it that I could descry nothing but a colossal mass rising from the sea and towering toward heaven. I stayed on deck until past ten o'clock in the hope of obtaining a nearer view of Stromboli, but we had soon left it behind us in the far distance, with other islands which lay on the surface like misty clouds. October 7th Today I hastened on deck before sunrise, to see as much as possible of the Sicilian coast, and to obtain an early view of Palermo. At ten o'clock we ran into the harbor of this town. I had been so charmed with the situation of Messina that I did not expect ever to behold anything more lovely, and yet the remembrance of this town faded from my mind when Palermo rose before me, surrounded by magnificent mountains, among which the colossal rock of St. Rosalia, a huge slab of porphyry, and granite towered high in the blue air. 
The combination of various colors unites with its immense height and its peculiar construction to render this mountain one of the most remarkable in existence. Its summit is crowned by a temple, and a good road, partly cut out of the rock, partly supported on lofty pillars of masonry, which we can see from on board our vessel, leads to the convent of St. Rosalia, and to a chapel hidden among the hills and dedicated to the same saint. At the foot of this mountain lies a gorgeous castle, inhabited, as my captain told me, by an English family, who pay a yearly rent of thirty thousand florins for the use of it. To the left of Palermo the mountains open and show the entrance to a broad and transcendently beautiful valley, in which the town of Montreal lies with magical effect. Several of these gaps occur along the coast, affording glimpses of the most lovely vales, with scattered villages and pretty country seats. The harbour of Palermo is picturesque and eminently safe. The town numbers about 130,000 inhabitants. Here, too, our deck was crowded with facchini, innkeepers, and guides, before the anchor was fairly lowered. I inquired of the captain respecting the price of board and lodging, and afterwards made a bargain with a host before leaving the ship. By following this plan I generally escaped overcharge and inconvenience. Arriving at the inn, I sent to Herr Schmidt, to whom I had been recommended, with the request that he would dispatch a trustworthy cicerone to me, and make me a kind of daily scheme of what I was to see. This was soon done, and after hurrying over my dinner I commenced my wanderings. I entered almost every church I passed on my way, and found them all neat and pretty. Everywhere I came upon picturesque villas and handsome houses, with glass doors instead of windows, their lower portion guarded by iron railings and forming little balconies. Here the women and girls sit of an evening, working and talking to their heart's content. The streets of Palermo are far handsomer and cleaner than those of Messina. The principal among them, Toledo and Casaro, divide the town into four parts, and join in the chief square. The streets, as we pass from one into another, present a peculiar appearance, filled with bustling crowds of people moving noisily to and fro. In the Toledo street all the tailors seem congregated together, for the shops on each side of the way are uniformly occupied by the votaries of this trade, who sit at work half in their houses and half in the street. In the coffee-houses and shops are all open, so that the passers-by can obtain a full view of the wares and of the buyers and sellers. The regal palace is the handsomest in the town. It contains a Gothic chapel, richly decorated. The walls are entirely covered with paintings in mosaic, of which the drawings do not display remarkable taste, and the ceiling is overcrowded with decorations and arabesques. An ancient chandelier, in the form of a pillar, made of beautiful marble and also covered with arabesques, stands beside the pulpit. On holy days an immense candle is put in this candlestick and lighted. I wished to enter this chapel, but was refused admittance until I had taken off my hat, like the men, and carried it in my hand. This custom prevails in several churches of Palermo. The space in front of the palace resembles a garden, from the number of avenues and beds of flowers with which it is ornamented. Second in beauty is the palace of the Senate, but it cannot be compared with that at Messina. End of section 35